Uh, Lloyd, you might know these people. Um, it's Michael and Sonny Mahal, the Mahal brothers. Uh, they've gone ahead and made their own production company. They've been making yes. tons and tons of movies. And we got another guest with them, uh, Mr. Richard Grieco. So without further ado, we're honored to uh, introduce Michael and Sonny Mahal. Let's roll with that. Come on, guys. Hey, what's up, brother? Hey, everyone. Thanks for having us back hey guys. here in the And uh, we actually got our start with a film on Lloyd Kaufman. The first two features were signed to Lloyd Kaufman. That's how we got our start. Uh, now we're at feature film 14, and uh, we're making films in like the half a million dollar budget range. Respect to Lloyd Kaufman. Yeah, respect to Lloyd Kaufman. <laughs> and we got a, and... guys. I'm excited to talk to the Hall brothers. These guys are they? They're magicians in the, in in film. They they actually manifest film consistently over and over and over again. Right um, really effective filmmakers, like from A to Z. And we got Richard Grieco, who was actually nominated for Best Actor at Shockfest Film Festival this year. Uh, oh, he was also he also won two years ago at a um, was that a disco? Really? That's a great surprise. Yeah, great. Great. That's a surprise for all of us. Good job, Richard. Honestly, his performance playing Dirk was just yeah. so amazing. Yeah. The night of the time, illustrate Clint Eastwood vibes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he even had uh, his hat made by the same designer that uh, did Clint Eastwood's hat. So that was really cool. That's all for Night of the Tommy Knockers. This is their movie that's in Shockfest. You can check out Night of the Tommy Knockers, starring Richard Grieco, uh, created by the Mahal Brothers. And uh, it is uh, nominated. We got uh, Richard Grieco nominated for Best Actor, and the film is nominated for Best Cult. So two nominations for this film. Um, Richard, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, your technique in uh, preparing for the role for uh, Tonight of the Tommy Knockers. What were some things you had to do? This is a period piece set in the Wild West. It's also a, a creature feature. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about your process. Um, I think talking to Michael and Sonny and Rolf and, and also uh, Sue about it in the beginning, we wanted to make a Western that had creatures in it. If you go into it making a creature movie with a backdrop of a Western, it fails. So what we did as a group, and, and thanks to... Um, the Mahals and, and Sue and, and, and Rolf um, is we stuck to the, the, the Western genre yeah. and made that about and made that the important part of the piece. And the backdrop were the monsters, which are great in it. So it, it creates a better storyline because when the monsters come, you're still in a Western because it feels like a legit Western. Um, and and we did, I mean, everyone did such a great job with that. Um, I think we were the only people filming at that time because it was at the height of COVID. I mean, I remember driving to 29 Palms and there was like no one on the road. I mean, it literally no test. one on the road. Yeah, there was no <laughs> self-test back then. So we had to do $150 blood test with the RN. So just to do the, the COVID testing was like $30,000 on the movie. What? That's crazy. <laughs> but to, as far as preparing for, for that, um, uh, Role. The thing about it, the thing about cowboys, which I, I know a lot of uh, cowboys actually, um, real real dudes and real girls, um, is that the the most important thing for a cowboy is is a hat, is his hat. And I was a big fan of Outlaw Josie Wales, um, um, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly, Fistful of Dollars, something like that. So. There was this one hat that Clint had that's really iconic, and I called this hat maker at uh, Baron Hats, and he made all of Clint's hats from the 70s through the 80s, 90s, and, and I said, can you replicate this hat? And, and he said, I can, and, uh, and he did it, and like, it took about 15, 16 days. Um, but uh, it just sets the tone for for me as a character. And then as far as him, because he, I mean, if you look at it on, on paper, he's the head of a, a, a gang of supposedly ruthless uh, you know, bandits and, and this and that. But there, I wanted to create something reserved about him that even though he, he did what he did, 
there was always kind of like a thing where it's not that he had a conscience, but he knew what he was doing in a way that it was okay. And he never hurt anybody that didn't have it coming. So I think the big thing for him was listening and not being the one to speak a lot because back then, if you speak a lot, you're usually the one that uh, it shows your vulnerability. I didn't want to show too much vulnerability with the guy. Um, and, uh, and they gave me, and Michael gave me room to play with it, with the, with the dialogue, with the lines and this and that. And, and, and the cast was great. I mean, uh, we were fortunate. Richard was really fantastic to work with. Uh, a lot of the actors he was coaching on set and great leader yeah. on, he was a great leader on set and he really brought the best out of everybody. And he helps the newer guys out. He takes the time to, you know, help yeah. people out. Yeah. So we <laughs> really appreciate that. Richard's yeah. great to work with. If yeah. you ever need a famous celebrity, he's the best. Yeah. That brings the skills. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. You've worked with Richard on a few productions now. Uh, guys, I would love to hear a little bit about how you guys connected and uh, some of the other films that you've worked on together. Man, you know, I was a huge fan of uh, Richard's growing up, like, you know, Night at the Roxbury when he pulls up <laughs> and, you know, the Lambo and gets out with the hot girl. I mean, like, you know, it was just somebody that I've always wanted to work with. And I always knew his name from watching his stuff, you know, uh, his major films and stuff decades ago. And I just really wanted to work with him. So one day we reached out to him through uh, IMDb Pro and you know uh, we we got to work together on Art of the Dead that was the first time yep. and then we brought him back on as the lead in Attack of the Unknown which won best picture at which, Shockfest yes yeah best, uh, actor 2020 yeah. so uh, and, and then you know we just we loved working with Richard and he's a phenomenal actor and then we just uh, progressed to uh, getting him on Night of the Tiny Knockers and yeah. him being the lead of you know ruthless outlaw gang it just it just felt right and yeah. it, you know worked out really yeah. Guys, I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about your uh, um, behind the scenes work on your production. Something you guys are really excel in is um, fundraising campaigns. You're like really, really good at it. Yeah. Sure. Um, and a lot of people talk to ask us at Shockfest for advice on how to how to raise money for your films. Um, I wanted to ask if you would, uh, if you're comfortable with it, if you could share some advice with some people here in the audience today on um, how they can um, get started making movies with uh, Indiegogo campaigns. Absolutely. And uh, the first question I get asked is what platform? Indiegogo or Kickstarter, Indiegogo is a lot better because you can get more than $10,000 worth of contributions from a single person. Plus the money on Kickstarter doesn't pull until the end of the campaign versus Indiegogo. When somebody contributes, you get the money right away. So Indiegogo is the best platform. The first thing I recommend doing, and we've raised over $3 million on Indiegogo alone, not including equity investments. The first thing you want to do is create an LLC. Uh, to avoid getting taxed and having it under your personal bank account. So form an LLC, get a business bank account, launch an Indiegogo campaign. The first thing you need to do, though, is invest in somebody making a good video for you. Because if you have a top-notch video, you have really good perks and graphics. I mean, people look at that and that's how they're going to judge whether they invest in you or not. So if you're not spending, you know, two or three grand before launching your campaign, you're not doing it right. So Key to take away from is good video, good perk graphics, good poster graphics. Um, and the, the next question is, well, how do I set my goal? So let's say I generally want to raise uh, a quarter of a million dollars per campaign. Um, and so I always say set the goal lower than what you actually want to hit. Let's say your goal's you know, $25,000, you know, set the goal at $10,000 because, you know, if you're a first time fundraiser, people look at it and they're like, wow, you know, $100 isn't going to do shit for the movie or do anything, but, you know, keep the budget or keep, keep the, uh, you know, uh, the cap on the goal as low as possible. Cause you know, once you crush the goal, then more people get interested in the project and want to contribute. Um, uh, so I always set the perks anywhere from $10 to uh, now we have a $100,000 perk. I used to laugh. People used to be, why do you have a $5,000 perk? Why do you have a $25,000 perk? I've had seven or eight people claim the $25,000 perk. So don't be afraid to uh, do bigger perks. The best investors are the ones that have already backed your campaign. Uh, somebody that's backed your campaign will back your campaign four to five times. So any day that I can't find money from you people, <clears throat> 
I will go through the list of backers that have already contributed and uh, go after them. Uh, what, what social media platform do you spend your time on? Well, there's you know Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. I found out LinkedIn, Twitter are virtually useless. I raise all the money from Facebook. How's it done? You literally have to spend all day messaging people. And uh, the best way to get money is look at who's putting money on other Indiegogo campaigns. Now that kind of seems a little shallow, but those type of uh, backers, you know, that invest in crowdfunding and are familiar with it, you have a better chance of getting them. So if I can't find money, I'll look at who's backing other people's campaigns, go after them. And uh, like, for instance, we launched a campaign three days ago. The goal was $100,000 for Alien Storm. We raised $100,000 and sixty-seven. dollars hours you know so we're gonna absolutely you know push that campaign um you know i would say uh keep changing your perks every week if you have the same perks over and over it gets really boring secret perks are your friends 95 percent of all the deals we do are secret perks let's say you hit up somebody for a thousand dollars they might not have a thousand dollars but they have 800 to give you so you can do secret under the table deals and send people a secret link and they can claim it and nobody knows what your secret deal is. So I do these secret deals all day and uh, that's how we raise the majority of our money. I actually spend $0 on advertising on Indiegogo. I found it's useless running Facebook ads and stuff. The best way is just to directly message people all day. Like I wake up and I try to raise money all day and then, you know, and then by two o'clock, if there's no money, then I start getting a little desperate and I start, you know, hitting, hitting, hitting people up for money and trying to do interesting things to, you know, raise the money. Um, Indiegogo works off an algorithm. So let's say you set your campaign at uh, $10,000. If somebody puts $1,000 on your campaign, you trend on the first page of Indiegogo film. And when you're trending, everybody on the Indiegogo platform sees it. And so, uh, you know, uh, get those contributions coming in, so a, uh, you know, uh, trending on Indiegogo. Um, always get a celebrity involved in your project because if you have somebody famous, people will pay big money to get roles with them. You know, people will pay five, ten thousand dollars to get a few lines with a famous person. Um, you know, make sure you have a Facebook page linked to your crowdfunding. If somebody contributes to your project, give them a shout out on Facebook. That's the best way. Hey, uh, Joe, uh, thanks so much for your $50 contribution. We appreciate you. And then, you know, keep sharing the uh, the link. Um, so, you know, when I first started crowdfunding, it took almost a month just to raise $10,000. And then so Indiegogo allows a one-time extension. You can extend a campaign up to 60 days. So if you're not at where your goal needs to be, extend your campaign. Uh, you know, now we're raising, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars every campaign. We've run 27 campaigns. We've never failed to reach a goal. We crush it every time. Uh, so we've, we've never been defeated in that regard. Uh, and then, you know, launch your campaign on a Friday. Friday's payday. Those are the best days to launch your campaign. Do not launch it early in the morning. Launch it after 2 o'clock. You're going to have, uh, you know, the most success. And, you know, and there's and, – and like I said, 90% of the traffic comes from Facebook. So focus only on Facebook. Don't be afraid to fail. I, I, I do every campaign and I have no like money pre-raised or anything. It's just, you know, just set the campaign, have some balls and just go with it. You know what I mean? That's the best way I can. If, if we had to wait for the funding to come in to make a movie, we would have never <clears throat> a single movie. and we're, we're at 14. So just go for it. Um, Somebody you know. was asking about how you physically set up the secret perks. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, if, if you go to perks and uh, uh, you go to add a perk, there's a scroll down option to create a secret perk. And then you type in what exactly goes with the perk. And then it provides a link. And then you send that link to the backer. And like I said, I would not raise nearly as much money as I do if it wasn't for those secret perks. That's like where, where, where we make all the money at. And so and we also have an LLC separate from indiegogo so if somebody drops you know five thousand on indiegogo the first thing we do is hit them up and uh get them to invest into our llc and send the money to our bank because with indiegogo you're losing eight percent of everything raised so if i raise a hundred thousand dollars eight thousand goes into the muck five thousand for credit card fees or five thousand for indiegogo 
five uh, percent for Indiegogo, and then the credit card companies take three percent, so you lose eight percent. So any money that you can take off campaign, do that uh, with an LLC. I have a subscription agreement. Each LLC has a hundred shares, so I shall sell stakes in the movie. You know, we sell a point anywhere from you know three to five thousand dollars, and then when the money comes out and as it generates revenue. Then those investors that own equity, we send out checks. So, you know, the best advice I can give you is just go for it. Don't be afraid to fail and, uh, you know, uh, keep making movies. That was awesome. The attendance boosted like crazy while you were talking. So. The attendance boosted like crazy. I'm going to came in, right? We want to hear what you got to say, Michael. Yeah, um, uh, you can go to mahalempire.com and it has, uh, uh, you can view all the trailers for our movies and it has our contact info. And I do uh, teach private crowdfunding classes, although I don't like to do it because these guys end up learning everything I know and then I'm competing against them and they're taking away my business. But it's all good. <laughs> it's like I'm here, I'm here to help. There's enough money for everybody. So, I go back to you guys are freaking wizards at executing. You are able to, you know, you, man, you you make the magic happen. People are investing in your movies. You're actually making the movies. You're producing them. You're delivering them, which is, gosh, so many people get the money and then they just don't even make the films. Um, yeah. I'd like to actually bring this back to Richard for a bit. Um, Richard, everything behind the scenes seems to be taken care of. I want to hear about the climate of working on a Mahal Brothers production. What's it like being on set with these guys? Um, they run a, they run a real tight ship. Um, um, everything is pretty organized, um, to the point, like, for example, um, one of the most important pieces when you're doing a period piece is wardrobe and the people they hire. And so everything we did was, was pretty right on the money for the 1800s. Um, um, the crews they have, which they use continuously a lot, the same people, um, are all great workers, great to get along with. Um, um, yeah, in this and they case, know what they're yeah, doing. Uh, Michael Sue is a cinematographer and director, and we've worked with him on uh, 10 movies now, and he's Richard and him just get along so good. Yeah, Michael is uh, Michael's a rock star. Um, he really is. Uh, I think the, the hiring process of what they do that they if you get somebody good if you get if you get a good AD a good director a good DP a good you know um, wardrobe person good makeup good you, you you tend to bring them back you know and and they've been fortunate enough and I think it's because of their demeanor anyways is because for one thing they're good guys they don't lie they don't bullshit and the product they make they they get so proud of what they're doing. And then you just really want to like, for example, some of those days up in um, uh, 29 Palms or so it was freezing, it was cold. Um, you have all these things going on, but you want to make the day and do a great job. So we would just go the extra mile. And, and the thing about them as well is everything they do gets a release, whether it be in video on demand, DVD, Blu-ray, um, uh, limited theatrical, Europe, they haven't been one project that they've done that hasn't gotten a release, which is so important today because you've been in, I've been involved in movies that were 10, 15 million dollar budgets that never get released. And you're like, what the hell happened? And the thing about it is when you do that and what they do, they have a system right now and how they work and who they hire and the climate on set is in a way such a free flowing work environment where you can actually do your craft um where you feel like you know kind of compelled to help other people out like for example there's other actors that haven't done it that much so you you just go to it and you talk to them um i mean we used to have powwows in that log cabin up there you guys remember that around that <laughs> cabin, you know where my little bedroom was right there and <laughs> And we would talk like that night about the next day's scenes. You know what I mean? And okay, okay, we got this, we got this, we got this, we got this. Okay, we got 14 pages tomorrow. Like, what can we cut that's not going to limit our film so we can spend more time on these other things? So those are all important things to do. And, and 
it's it, it's not easy to do. It's very hard to do, but the way they pull things off with all the people they have and all, and then, and they, and I consider all these people, my friends though, is that they do it in a way where it seems easy. And the climate on set has always been, I've never seen arguments on set. I've never seen any hissy fits on set. I've never seen any kind of thing. And, and, uh, and when an actor or actress comes on one of their movies, um, it's a welcoming atmosphere um, because we want them to, to uh, succeed and do a great job. I do, especially being an actor and also director and, and so like that. I want them to do a great job because it's good, just going to make us look better anyway. So in that reference, um, um, it's just uh, it's the perfect environment. I mean, you know, they, they get it done. They really do. Oh, thank you, man. That's the no, you do. best compliment I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> you know, we, we really care about the movies. And unlike a lot of producers, the movie comes first before we take a, a penny. So 80% of the time, we don't even take a salary on these movies. A lot of the times, it's not by choice, you know. But, uh, you know, we, we want to do the right thing for the movie. And if it needs a, a better sound composer, we need more CGI work. That comes first before we pay ourselves because we have created a formula where as long as we keep finishing the movie and doing a good job it's basically an unlimited supply of money so um we're in it for the long haul to uh, make good films we're here, we're here to make good movies and we want to go to the studio level so we're prepared to put everything in every movie and and to to reach that level and, uh, Jeremy Hurst, Leonard, uh, Devaney Penn, thank you guys for uh, tuning in, too. We appreciate you guys. We love you. Yeah, we love you. <laughs> Especially you, Jeremy Hurst. You invest a lot of money in our movies. <laughs> Which is great because it looks like you guys, like, gosh, I was talking to Juliette Landau earlier on these panels about how she's building a machine. There's, there's more to what she's building than just a single movie. You guys are doing the same. There's so many facets to what you do. I mean, the, the incredible le lecture you were just sharing about uh, – tips on raising money, but also Richard's personal, like, um, God, what's the word? Uh, experiences being on your set. It sounds like you also really genuinely care about the climate of being on set. And I'd like to ask you about that, how important it is uh, keeping everybody happy on set. And oh yeah, how hard it, it is. I say the, the most important really position on a set is it, the ADs because they're the ones creating the shooting schedule. They're the ones running the set, making sure organizing organized. Everybody knows what time they need to show up for wardrobe, what time, you know, the set starts, just everything. So like on this movie, we had Adam Worth. He's the best logistical person that I've ever worked with. I would hire him every single movie because before we worked with somebody like Adam, uh, like call sheets wouldn't go out on time on our first movies. People didn't really know what they were doing. Uh, we'd shoot three or four days over schedule. And now that we have a team and somebody like Adam is the AD, uh, we're on time and we're 12 hours and we're out every day. Very rarely we'll do an hour or two overtime a week. And, uh, and we just, when we find people that we like to work with and they do a good job, then, you know, well, we're going to keep hiring them. That's yeah. why our sets are really laid back. We just got a good, you know, group of professionals that yeah. really work together. They, they want to be there. They want to create this, you know, wonderful art, artistic movie. And I, I, I love it. I love when a group of like, like that comes together. We just, we make something monumental and amazing together. And that's just it, right? Everybody has a common goal. You guys have perfected the art of creating a common goal for a team of people. And yeah, that's incredible. It's a challenging just, thing. I think just, everybody uh, in the don't audience let anything great. stand in your way, especially money. If you want to make a movie, willpower will get you there. You know, willpower, hard work, and never giving up. You know, I'm sure there was a point in every single movie out of the 14 movies we did could have fell apart at some point, <laughs> but never give up and just, you know, keep following and, your dreams. And it took us, what, after film school, maybe 15 years before, you know, a film career to even took off for us. Yeah, because, uh, you know, our, our first couple movies, we self-funded them or we had our parents help. And, you know, there was a lot of struggle. We learned that comedy isn't a good genre to do movies. Our first two movies were comedies. What's funny here in America isn't funny oh, in yeah. India or China because of cultural differences. So, you know, we found out horror was where profitability was. And, and until we started doing horror films, 
or spinoffs in horror, we didn't see any money come in. Now, you know, we're getting, you know, minimum guarantees from the distributors and we're seeing checks come in every 90 days to pay out investors. So um, it, it's, it's a win-win. And, and horror uh, works because what's scary here is going to be scary everywhere, you know, not yeah. like comedy. Yeah. And there, there's <laughs> a good uh, market for it. But uh, uh, remember always, you know, you, you need stars in your movie to, to be able to get a minimum guarantee. Nobody's going to give you an advance unless you have uh, a big yeah. star like, you know, Richard Rico or a Tom Sizemore or Robert Lozardo. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, Somebody, yeah. the, the advances that you get on a movie, the minimum guarantees you get from a distributor, those are based on uh, the bankability of the cast you have. So just keep that in mind. Always have at least one big star in your movie and never give up. Exactly. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much. I do want to ask all three of you one question each really, really quick before we uh, let you go. Uh, Richard, for you, mm. what is the value of performing you've been doing this for so long why do you stay uh, as an actor instead of pursue a different career what keeps you in this game same with michael and sonny what keeps you guys in this game as opposed to pursuing anything else um, well, because now now we're making three movies a year and we're raising you know seven figures a year so now the money's finally starting to come in it took years of struggle but uh now we've gotten to a point where we can make money doing this full time and we have been doing it for over you know three years now so there's nothing more I love. You go through every uh, spectrum of human emotion when you make a movie, from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs, yeah. and then just to see that final product, it just makes life worth living. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we don't do the whole, you know, I, I did nine to five for all my life working for CBS, Time Warner Cable, ABC, Fox making TV commercials. I did TV commercials. I write, produce, shoot, direct, and edit them. It was like a one-man operation. And then, you know, eight years ago, we made our first movie, 30 Girls, 30 Days. We signed that to Troma. Then we did Last Day of School with Troma. And Troma is just a great launching pad. I really love Uncle Lloyd Kaufman. I love his wife. We're good friends with them. And uh, that's not a bad place to get your start. You know, you're not going to make much money, but they're going to, you know, help launch your career, put lot, you on those platforms. A lot of famous filmmakers and actors have come yeah. from Troma. So. I really think, you know, now we're getting a good fan base and, and things are going great and, and I love it. Thank you guys. Uh, Richard, I did want to go back to you on this question. Um, it's something that's inherent. Um, I live and breathe art, whether it be movies, painting, music, um, writing, directing. Um, I can't see me doing anything else ever. Um, I never feel, um, I'm never happy so or content. So I always want to strive to get better. Um, and it's something that in acting, directing, painting, music, you can always do something. Plus it, it's an emotional thing for me because everything stems from emotion as far as acting. It's got to come from a place. So when I can play different characters and different and and kind of exude emotions that I'm afraid to show people that I'm talking to in person, on camera, I feel a freedom to be something that I never would show like even a best friend. Because to me, in front of the camera, I feel free. And it's a freedom, and I can almost feel the heat from the lens. It's a freedom that uh, I can't explain. Um, I don't think I would want to explain it, even if I knew it, because I think if I knew what I wanted to say about how I felt, then the feeling would be jaded. So I live and breathe it. and. And I love it more in life itself. So, guys, this half hour was beyond memorable. This is so too fucking cool. really quick. <laughs> I, I, wrote, I know, really I know. Um, guys, the legendary Richard Grieco, and of course the future, the, the future filmmakers of horror, uh, Tony and Michael Mahal, and the present. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, how can we find the Mahal Empire? How can we find more of your work? Thanks to all the viewers. Well, thanks thanks Thank to everybody. everybody who tuned in. Feel free to reach out to us on uh, Facebook and we'll answer any questions you have about 
crowdfunding or filmmaking or whatever. We're always open. We'd like to get back. These guys are advocates of art and, and man, they're 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 making history as we speak. So pay attention to the Mahal Empire because there's more to come. And and Richard, thank you for such an incredible performance. And Night of the Tommy Knockers. This movie has been nominated twice at Shockfest this year. It's on the platform. Every single one of you have as access to watch the movie after the award ceremony. Go check it out. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. And we're proud to have you. Uh, we're honored to have you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you guys everybody. so much. Thanks, everybody that tuned in. And don't leave yet because we're going to have the award ceremony very soon. Coming up. The ceremony is going to be in about an hour.